It's time for us to check back in with Louisa in Mountain Path and see what happens next. If you've missed any of the previous chapters of this book, you can look in the description below for a playlist. Noon recess was almost over. Rye had returned from her play and now leaned in one of the schoolhouse windows and sniffed the hot, quick August wind that had been sweeping steadily down the valley since early morning. Teacher, I do hope you cut language and geography short, she said to Louisa, who leaned from another window and tried to see if the sow hog just going under the floor had eight or nine red and white pigs. I cut school so short now, it's a wonder your father doesn't say something, Louisa told her. My old pop is the best trustee in the whole county, Rye said. He wouldn't mind if and you didn't have no school and all this good apple drying weather we're having. When I was home this dinner, Mom, she says to me, get back here early now, Rye. I need you in the apple cutting. This'll maybe be the last good spell of apple drying weather we'll have. She's a cutting them herself like fighting fire. It isn't right to have too much school when the apples and weather are right for drying, Louisa solemnly agreed. I suppose if I dismiss early, I'll help cut apples too. Now ain't that a pity. We just got two knives, one for me and one for Mom. Pop, he's been a laying off to make us a knife, but it's like Mom says, laying off is what Pop is the best at except maybe playing the fiddle and such like. Louisa resolved to dismiss school early. She had had a suspicion that the Lee Buck cows had only two knives suitable for paring apples, but wanted to be certain lest she commit herself to an afternoon of apple cutting. I'm sorry I can't help out with the apples, but I'll find something to do, she told Rye, knowing what the something would be. She still wanted to visit the cave on the river, and since Rye and the other children had already made it clear that they would not take Teacher to the place, Teacher had made up her mind to go alone at the first opportunity. This afternoon was ideal for such a journey of exploration. A primer lesson for Pete and Quiet and language and geography for the whole school were finished so quickly that Rye expressed her gratitude for Teacher's thought for the apple drying. Everybody ran down the hot sand of the school road, and with thoughts of their own apples to be cut, the Hayes cows and Mark and Royal did not tarry in Lee Buck's yard as that was their custom, but hurried home, leaving Corey and Rye to work untroubled with company. Pete was put on the porch roof to spread the apples Corey had cut and to turn those that were partly dry. Beetle sat on the porch floor and played with a mule shoe and string of green wooden beads Louisa had given her. Since no one seemed to need teacher, she told Corey of her plan to take a long walk, maybe around the pumps. You better watch out for rattlesnakes and them mean herb cow hogs, Corey told her, dumping a pan of apples into her lap. Too bad I can't spare one of the young'uns to go with you. It'll be all right, Louisa said, and felt a little guilty. Corey would be worried if she knew what lay in teacher's head. The cave was a dangerous place, the children had said. No need to tell Corey and cause her uneasiness, she thought. She took matches and cigarettes. She sometimes stole a smoke while walking alone. And after making certain that none of the busy family watched her, went across the road and into the barn. There she got the carbide light that Lee Buck always left hanging on a peg in the hallway. Not long ago, Chris had showed her how such a lamp was made to flame so that she knew enough to open it and put in fresh carbide from the fruit jar on a shelf. Not wishing to risk a chance encounter with Lee Buck or Chris, who she supposed were working somewhere in the lower fields, she did not follow the path but skirted the ridge side, taking care to walk always with a few trees between her and the cane and cornfields. She knew only that the cave was at the mouth of the creek and reasoned that if she followed the valley floor until she came to the river bluff, the cave would then be just under her feet. She had just passed within a short distance of the Hayes Cow Cabin when she heard the lazy grunting of hogs a few feet from where she walked. 
somewhat startled and a little fearful of the half-wild razorbacks that frequented the unfenced portion of the country, she did not hurry on, but stopped and looked around. The hogs she soon saw were safely pinned and were not razorbacks, but sleek black Berkshires, uncommon in the hills. She wondered that Hayes should build a hog pen in such a spot so far from his house, half hidden in the ivy bush and sheltered on one side by a low vine-covered bluff. She walked on a step or so until among the vines on the cliff she saw the bright orange of trumpet vine flowers and thinking that such gay things would look well put into a fruit jar and set on her mantle, she started to pick a bouquet. She had broken two of the dark stiff stems when a dog sprang out of the tangle of vines near the flowers and barked at her. She dropped the flowers and jumped back in fright but did not run away. The dog continued to bark and soon another trotted up and let out a few half-hearted growls. She remembered them then and was no longer afraid. They were the dogs that followed Chris one with the brown ringed eyes, the other the gray spotted hound. She wished she knew their names. She would have liked their company to the cave. She tried a few calls of doggy, doggy, but they only looked at her and the spotted one began barking again. Afraid that their noise could be heard at the Hayes cows or by Chris who might be somewhere near, she left the dogs and the unpicked flowers and went on toward the river. She climbed down the bluff, not far from the spot where she and the children had stood and looked at the river on the day she visited Hayes's. The ease with which one could descend the face of the bluff surprised her a little. It was high, but not steep or dangerous. Once down and past a clump of river bush, Louisa gasped as a little at what she saw. A wide, quiet stream, clear as melted snow and but little warmer, flowed from the mouth of what appeared to be an enormous cave. It rose dome shape almost to the top of the bluff and extended backward into the remote regions of blackness. Long blunt stalactites hung from the roof giving it much the appearance of the vast toothed maw of some fabulous monster. She would like to bring all her school children picnic in here someday, she thought. It was such a pretty spot with the thick trunked sycamores stretching their low white limbs above the water and Cave Creek itself with mint and moss between the stones and the periwinkle shells shining white in the water. She walked back into the cave a short way and sat down on a great flat stone by the creek and smoked a cigarette. When her eyes had grown accustomed to the twilight, she noticed a skiff in apparently good condition drawn just within the mouth of the cave and chained to a staple wedged into the cave wall. She wondered if the boat were Lee Buck's, the cave she supposed was on his land. The cool half-darkness of the place was pleasant and she was not afraid. She had been in other caves a smattering of geology had given her an interest in rock formations which had added to the natural curiosity she held for all things and made it imperative that she put water into the carbide lamp, strike the flint, and walk back a little way. The going though not difficult was unpleasant. The passage narrowed until there was a little space to walk except in the cold creek water. She went slowly, glancing often over her shoulder to make certain that a faint streak of daylight lay always behind her and flashed the light up and about so as not to miss anything. When she had gone a short way, she saw a low passage leading up and away from the creek. White feathery stalactites glittered in the glow of her light, thinking that she might find something of interest and at the same time save wetting her feet she turned away from the creek and went up the corridor. From time to time, initials on the stone reassured her. Other people had been here before. The place could not be dangerous. When she had reached still another turning, she decided that to go farther would not be safe since more than one possible way might confuse her. She was in no hurry. The place would be an ideal spot for another cigarette. There was little likelihood that anyone would come to trouble her in such a place. She seated herself, comfortable, on a piece of limestone, placed the carbide against the wall in such a fashion that it gave a minimum of light and gave herself up to a complete enjoyment of the situation. 
There was, she felt with satisfaction, little danger of a chance passerby so much as smelling the smoke. The air current seemed to be moving to some region behind her, and there would, of course, be no one back there. All sound of the outside world was dead, and about her there was a deep stillness broken only by the musical note of a single drop of water falling at measured intervals into another water farther away into the passage. She took her time, for she rather liked sitting there. The sensation of absolute nothingness was new. The carbide was but a single point of brightness, revealing nothing. All sound of the outside world was dead, and about her there was a deep stillness broken only by the musical note of a single drop of water falling at measured intervals into other water farther away in the passage. The sound was a pleasant sound, and for lack of anything else to do, she fell to counting between each drop. She counted for some time. One, two, three, four, five, clink. Always five counts, and then the single note, clink. She counted to five, paused in expectancy of the sound that there was certain to come, but none came. The pause grew to an interval, and beginning again, she counted to twenty. Still no sound. The water, she reasoned, had dropped in just that measured fashion for hundreds, perhaps thousands of years. It would not now suddenly cease without cause. Something had come between the drop and the pool beneath it. A snake, perhaps, or a bat. She was not frightened. So fixed in her mind was the one fear that someone might chance by and find her with a cigarette that her proximity to some small, harmless animal seemed a comparatively unimportant thing. She continued to wait, the cigarette hidden in her cupped hand. Her body bent forward a trifle so as to hear the sound again when the animal or whatever it was moved away. Her reason told her that no human would stand perfectly still there in the darkness watching the red glow of her cigarette or the muffled brilliance of the carbide at her feet. There came another clink and she knew that whatever it was had moved away, but in which direction? She listened again, but heard nothing except another drop of water. It was most probably a snake, she concluded, and with a sudden, heart-quickening desire for light. She had only to bend over and pick up the light, and all this nonsense would be over with, and she could have another cigarette, for the one, interrupted as it was, had only whetted her appetite for another. She would do it quickly and perhaps frighten whatever it was. She waited, crouched with her hand just above the light, taking care that no rays should fall on her. The clink came again, and she jerked the lamp swiftly, sending the bright flame in the direction of the sound. Instead of an animal, the narrow beam of light revealed a man's bent elbow and an expanse of blue overall bib. The hand was not visible. It was under the overall bib, but in the split second she saw before dropping the lamp, the bent elbow jerked outward. A burned finger and thumb, rather than fright, accounted for the dropping of her light. She looked at her feet and saw with some irritation that in falling, the carbide had turned on its back so that the blue striped hem of her dress was thrown into vivid prominence. The light had scarcely touched the ground when the man uttered a low ejaculation and started coming toward her through the darkness. She felt utterly foolish sitting there. She had visions of returning to Lexington next day while Lee Buck wrote the superintendent Russell for another teacher, one not given to hiding in caves and smoking. She wondered who the man might be and why he was there. She would know soon enough. Still, she was not afraid as he stepped at last into the range of the light, and she saw that it was Chris. She said nothing. There seemed to be nothing to say. She only sat there, crouched on the cold stone, and wondered what the tall man with his head in the darkness above her would say and think. Gradually, she became aware of his breathing. It was short and hard, like that of a person in a nightmare. He bent over and picked up the light, and she saw that he quivered a little in his long brown hands. She wished he would say something, but most likely he stood there and wished the same thing of her. Still without speaking, he seated himself near her on the stone. His long body doubled 
on the lower seat. The light wavered over his face, and she saw that it was pale, the nostrils quivering, and the short upper lip curled inward until his teeth gleamed white in the shadow. She noticed, too, an irregular streak of soot on his forehead. He took a sack of bull durham from his overalls and rolled a cigarette with hands that still shook a little. Louisa saw her opening. I know that you and, and people here think it's terrible that that is to smoke, uh, for a woman, I mean, but I, I've always liked to smoke, and today I walked down here, and I, I thought this would be a good place to... Her voice ebbed and died in the manner of an abashed child's. He lit his cigarette from the carbide flame, blew a slow cloud of smoke, and seemed to consider her words. My grandma smoked a pipe, he said, and blew two smoke rings. Is what Lee Buckle think all that's worrying you? That's plenty. I'd hate to lose my job. Lee Buck wouldn't mind if you smoked in the schoolhouse, and if you did get fired, some things might be worse. I can't think of anything worse that could happen to me. Not even if you hadn't to drop that light when you did? It was a long moment before the full implication of his words came to her. Then it was like one of those picture puzzles in which one picture, if the observer looks at it long enough, breaks suddenly into other and different pictures. The children's unwillingness to take her to the cave, the boat, and the arm under the overall bib. She bent and softly touched the clothing opposite his right elbow. She felt cold. Suppose... Suppose she had been the man Chris feared she was. Would she have been here now? The thought of what could so easily have happened to a man here in the darkness made her sick with terror. But oddly enough, the presence of the one capable of causing such a thing to happen was reassuring. Why did you tell? She asked and drew a long, sobbing breath. You'd guess. Anybody would. You won't tell. It was not a question, but a statement, terse and flat. His confidence pleased her. She wondered a little irritably why it was that this long murderer with his steel blue eyes had so much the power to please or displease her. Ordinarily, people and their pleasures mattered little to her. She had never really loved anyone enough to make their pleasures a thing of great importance. Now that she had met someone who made it matter without love or friendship hardly, she felt uncomfortably fettered and burdened. Smoke some more. Don't mind me, he said, holding a match for a light. Their eyes met above the flame, both smiled, and the fear and tension were gone. Can't you smoke up the chimney, he asked after a time. She laughed and told him of her unsuccessful attempt, and he promised to clean the chimney next day. I wish you'd tell me a little about Steele's, she begged, feeling normally curious once more. We better go outside, he said, rising. This place belongs mostly to Lee Buck and Hayes, and one might drop in. They sat in the still shade of a sycamore down by the river, and Chris told her about Steele's. She listened while he told her of how his mother once looked out the church window during a morning service and saw a stranger that she did not like and ran all the way home by a back way so as to get down some sprouted corn that was drying on the roof. Yes, that was dried sprouted corn that Corey had carried from the loft room that day. Listening to the slow words of his softly bitter voice, she saw things as doubtless the Bledsoe women saw them. It was not wrong to make good whiskey, and no law could make it wrong. Always they had made it, the Bledsoes and the Andersons and the Calhouns. She saw that they would continue to make it. Nothing could stop them, as nothing could stop them from hunting without a license or killing each other when they saw reason to kill. In twenty years or sooner, Pete and Lander would still hear in the cave just as their fathers did. Chris said nothing of the talk that he had killed a man, and she was loath to speak of it. Now she felt that it was true, and the thought saddened her. It was not because one man she had never known was dead, but because Chris had had to kill him. While he sat in the shade and talked to her, 
tormented misgivings about the workings of those things referred to her by her own kind as laws and civilization troubled her. By all the standards that had been set up for her out there in the world, Chris was uncivilized and lawless. Yet to himself and those who knew him, he was a lawful man. She caught glimpses of something deeper than words written on paper by other men calling themselves legislators. Chris's laws were of the Hill Law, older than the modern mechanism of law, rooted in freedom and living in people rather than in books. Chris and Lee Buck and Corey and others of their kind she knew, with the same certainty that she knew her name, would not steal or fail to give a guest the best their place afforded. They would not lie except in connection with such things as moonshining, neither would they be friendly with an enemy or forget to hate one they had determined to hate. They sent their children to school because they wanted to and not because of a state law that they had never heard of. Such thoughts were confusing. They left her without a yardstick for measuring people and their conduct. Back in Lexington and in school people were tagged and labeled. They were worth so much or had bred so many winners or had so many letters after their names or had published so many books or spent so many years in research. Here there was none of that. Held in the maze of her thoughts, Louisa had not noticed Chris's long silence or that the shadow of the sycamore tree had long since become merged into the long blue shade that lay across the river and touched the topmost branches of the willows on the other side. Teacher, you'd make a good one to go fishing or hunting with. You can sit still so long, Chris said and got up. Louisa scrambled to her feet. I didn't know it was so late, but Corey is so busy in the apples, maybe she won't think to worry, she said, sorry that her time with him was gone. Chris looked toward the cave. I don't know as I need to go back that way. I wasn't working, just kind of getting things ready. We'll have to go by the pen, though, else them fool dogs will lay all night awaiting. Don't you always come and go this way, she asked as he helped her up a ledge in the bluff hardly ever. The hog pens by a hole in the cliff that comes down and there's about a dozen others. It wouldn't do to come and go the same way all the time. The one by the pens the shortest and when Zoli and Bluth bark anybody working down below can hear. Louisa laughed. They warned you then that I was there when I tried to pick the flowers. Chris nodded. Only trouble was they couldn't tell me who it was. I hope they didn't scare you. That's the prettiest trumpet vine. We'll get some like you wanted when we go by. They climbed the bluff to the spa and the dog still lay hidden among the vines by the low cliff. This time they did not bark. Zoli, the mongrel with the brown ringed eyes, trotted up and touched Chris softly with his nose. But Bloof, the gray spotted hound who went always first through all the gates, only lay and watched until Chris and Teacher had gathered the flowers. The hog set up a grunting and squealing for something to eat, and Chris looked away toward Hayes' house and wondered aloud if Lander had forgotten to feed them. It's his job, he said. Lee Buck promised to make him a fiddle if he'd feed the hogs good all the time. There's no mash. They're Lee Buck's hogs so far from his barn? Yes, he thought it up. You see, mash, when it's cooked and done, with steel, smells enough to stink up the river. Lee Buck figured to feed it to these hogs this fall and winter, he thought they'd eat it up and the hog smell would kind of kill the mash smell. Lee Buck, Louisa said and meant it, must be a very smart man. He can do something beside trusteeing, Chris agreed, but I hate this steel so low under the ground. Ours at home was in, in a rock house on a hill. I like to be where I can see off. You must get tired of living in this valley. It's all right. Come on, Blue. We're going home. They walked in silence up the valley. It was milking and barn work time, so they followed the path through the fields, unafraid of meeting anyone who might wander at Louise's presence too near the cave. The whippoorwills had set up their first faint calling, and now and then a firefly glowed among the corn and cane, Though high above on Kinder's Mountain, the last rays of the sun made the tips of the pine trees into golden spires rising out of the smoke-like shadow. 
They came to a bit of the path where there were no fields, only trees, and the smell of marigolds and overripe apples falling strong and heavy down the hillside. Through the trees, Louisa could see the Peter L.G. cabin and something shining white in the steep yard which might have been Aunt L.G.'s pretty by nights or snow on the mountain. Chris, she thought, would tell her about the lost fiddle and the boy Davy who had gone away. She turned to him but said nothing when she saw that he had not noticed the smell of the marigolds and was not thinking of her or the old woman or of anything in the valley. He walked and watched the fiery thatching fade from the hills. There was, she thought, a longing or a hunger in his face. Or maybe she imagined it that. It seemed bleak as always, less alive than when he had talked to her down by the river. She wondered if he could be homesick. She had since coming to the valley been homesick for a way of life, but not for home. She glanced at him again. He wanted something, but a childish desire to go home or get away from the place he was now in would not do that to his face. She pitied him, but was glad that he was not at home or any place else. She liked things as they were, just walking with him up the valley. So at least we're beginning to find out what part of the mystery is, what we'd already kind of figured about the moonshine. And so they're a family that makes moonshine. Uh, so that's an interesting part of the story that we've reached. We found out what were those, when you you think back to one of those first chapters when she first arrived at Lee Buck Cows and, and Corey was hiding stuff in the lo loft. Now we know what she was hiding, the sprouted corn. So we're beginning to find out a, a little bit at least about what the mystery is. We kind of already had a inclination or some um, little foreshadowing, I guess, of the liquor, of the moonshining going on, but now we know for sure that's what it was. It's interesting that she got to stay with Chris. She got to spend the afternoon with him. Uh, still interested in this chapter. Still, she's trying to see where these mountain people fit into the world that she's always known. She's thinking about the law and how everything's structured, yet they don't live like that, yet somehow the way they live seems okay, even though it's not okay according to the structures that she knows. So she's, she's still trying to figure all that stuff out. I love the part about the drying the apples and the whole family pitching in. In those days, uh, because you needed all that food for the winter to make it through the winter, and it was typical for the whole family to pitch in. So Rye was helping. Pete was on top of the roof turning the apples. So everyone was pitching in to help. I really like that part. I love the description of the river and of the, or the creek and the cave. Oh man, wouldn't you like to see it? Now I'm a big chicken when it comes to going into caves, so I don't think, I might like to sit at the edge of it, like that first place where she sat and smoked the cigarette, but you would not find me going deeper in. I start feeling like I, I can't breathe. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard this song, makes me think of the song always. It's a Johnny Paycheck song, actually, The Cave. Uh, but I actually, the first time I heard it was Josh Williams. His, he has a, um, where he's recorded it. it. was Josh Williams is more of a bluegrass, or is a bluegrass performer, and that's where I first learned the song, but it's actually a Johnny Paycheck song. So if you hear that song, it makes you really fear or think about how deep, dark caves can be and, and what can happen while you're in one. I won't spoil the song for you. It's one of those story songs, so if you want to go listen to that. But I would love to have seen that and, and be kind of where, be right there at the edge of the cave, but also where her, where Louisa and Chris are sitting under the sycamore tree and talking about life. And he tells her about the stealing, stealing they call it, instead of moonshine and stealing, which is, is interesting too. So I hope you enjoyed this chapter. I hope that you'll leave a comment and let me know what, what jumped out to you in this chapter. What were your favorite parts? Um, and I hope that you'll continue to drop back by so we can find out what else happens to Louisa in Mountain Path.